Luke chapter 19, verse 28. Luke 19, 28 and following. And while you're doing that, there are several things in the bulletin that I'm sure you would be interested in. I'm getting an echo up here. Can you, is there something, something there going kind of funny there? Are you getting an echo too, or is it just me? It's just me. Maybe it's my ears. <laughs> Can't do anything about that. So uh, we're looking here at the, uh, the bulletin. In a couple weeks, there's a door hanger ministry. That's on the 24th, be in the morning at 9 a.m. We're going to go uh, and put door invitations to Easter Sunday on doorknobs around a community uh, in the south of Woodland there <clears throat> and let them know we're here because not a lot of people in that end of town know we're out here. So we're going to think there's a thousand of them. So see Dave. Where's Dave at? Dave Tucker. You're here somewhere. You may have gone. Anyhow, you, uh, you need to see him and he's in charge of that. Dave Tucker is. And then that same evening, <clears throat> the 24th, Dr. Stephen Collins will be here to give the report on the dig that I was not at this year. Generally, when I, it's about this time of year, I've come back from the dig and I give you a report about what happened. Well, being as high I was not there, it's kind of hard to do. So we're bringing the big guy here to do that for you, and you'll be the first group to hear from uh, <clears throat> Dr. Collins in this report. So it's at 6 p.m., and it'll be right in here. I think you're going to appreciate that. Some great stuff there this year. I'm, I'm anxious to see what actually happened. Uh, there's several other things. Now that I got your attention to the bulletin, start reading and you know, take in all, that, all the other things happening. Now today we're talking about something called the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday Parade. <clears throat> As I entitled the, the message, the Jesus Parade. And it's a, a, a strange parade because there's... Uh, only it's focused around one person on a donkey, or on a s small donkey at that, a young one. And it was, uh, th that's not much of a parade, not much to get excited about. I don't think if we said we're having a Christmas parade in downtown Woodland, and, uh, and uh, one of our staff, myself or Dave, started wa walking down, uh, leading a dog or, or riding on a little pony, uh, that's not going to get a whole lot of attention. You think 10,000 people would show up for that? I don't think so. But this was Jesus. And it turned into quite a parade for him. And thousands of people were at this, this parade. Now, we're going to be looking at this. What I'd like to do is read it. By the way, this, this is a, a found in all four Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each has a little bit of different something to add to it. <clears throat> I like Luke in this one, and I'll be reading it, and you can follow, and I'm going to show you quite a few pictures here today, so um, you're going to be able to see this as we go. The triumphal entry, after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he reached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, uh, now let's, you'll, you'll, the, the, well, in a moment, and saying, go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. So, those who were sent away and found it, just as he had told them, as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put it on Jesus. And he was going, and as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. I always thought that was an interesting passage where Jesus tells these guys to go and find this colt, and he's tied up there at a certain location, and just take it. That'd be like me telling one of you, you know, there's this car <laughs> <laughs> over uh, on the other end of town. Uh, I want you to go over there and, and get it for me. And if the owner asks you anything, just say, oh, Carl wants it. Uh, and, uh, Don't forget it's a brand new car. Yeah, you better believe it. Yeah, yeah. So, well, it wouldn't be exactly that way because I think it was prearranged. But anyhow. <clears throat> and then he, they said the Lord has need of it. So they brought it to Jesus. They threw their coats on the colt and put, it on Je and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the ground. As soon as he was approaching, 
near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in the heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if, I, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. All right, let's get right into this. And several points about this. They all begin with the letter P. I had to work on this one a little bit. I had to get Jeannie's help on this one. Think of a word, you know, uh, that goes with this. But anyhow, it was a planned event. In verses 28 through 36, Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was carefully and deliberately planned. It was no sudden impulsive action. It wasn't, so Jesus didn't just say, well, let's go have a parade. Um, Jesus did not leave things until the last moment. Uh, he, uh, he had apparently made a prior arrangement with the owners of the colt, and the Lord has need of it may have been a password chosen long ago after he had met them, and it may not have been. It may have been something where they just said, okay, and God let it happen. But uh, it, more than likely, this was a planned event, and the reason I say that is because this whole event, there's more meaning to it than just an impromptu thing. This whole event had been planned. This, there was nothing unplanned about Jesus' triumphal entry. The main point to learn here is that Jesus was in complete control over every event that was about to take place. Not, not just that event, but every event of that week, because this is called Passion Week that they were talking, talking about there. It's the week before Jesus uh, goes to the cross and is resurrected. It's during that whole week a lot of things happen. Everything during that week was planned. It was in the plan of God. He knew what awaited him. He understood what his father expected of him. And he carried out his father's will for his life with a deliberate control all the way through. So, and that should be a great comfort to God's people. Jesus is not the victim of circumstances beyond his control. Instead, he's in a deliberate control of everything that happens to him in all the circumstances, even circumstances in your life. And he still is, he is still in deliberate control over every event today. He's not just saying, oh, he doesn't sit wringing his hands wondering what's going to happen next. It's his plan. There's nothing that is beyond his deliberate and purposeful plan, including what was going to happen to him at the end of the week when he'd go to a cross. So you may wonder, why are you talking about triumphal entry today <laughs> and Palm Sunday stuff today? Well, it's not that I'm confused and have the Sundays messed up. Uh, I'm going to talk about the cross next week. It's because Dr. Collins is going to be here on Palm Sunday, okay? So uh, it's kind of... Now, I, uh, that doesn't work well. So we're doing it today and getting an order of things here. We're going to the beginning of the week this week. Next week, we'll look at the end of the week and what happened. Let me show you a couple pictures. Need, you have to take the lights up and down on this. I just have a couple here, or else you won't be able to see them. Yeah, take the lights down, even these down here, especially where I'm at, because that's, okay. This is, uh, this is Bethany. And as Jesus went up to Bethany, uh, he was coming from Jericho, and he went up to Bethany. It's just a small town, and some even question whether that's the right spot, but it's the only one on the other side of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, oh, there it is, is up in here. It's on the other side of the hill. You climb the hill and go up. Now, Bethphage, they, it mentions both of those. We have no idea. They haven't found Bethphage. So we know that Bethany is here. Now go to the next one, and it'll show you. When I take tours to Israel, I don't even go here because there's only one thing to see, and that's this here. You go into this tomb. See what it says? St. Lazarus' tomb. And they have no idea whether that's St. Lazarus' tomb or not. It just happens to be a tomb in Bethany, and they named it that. So that's a, it's a tourist trap. 
So you no need to go there. There's nothing to, uh, to see other than no, knowing this is what Jesus did. He went up over the hill and then into the city. And this, uh, this, is, where, uh, he, this is where it began with the colt that would be taken. So he's going to ride that colt up over the hill and go into Jerusalem. Now, let's look at the uh, next point. This is a, a, a king of peace. And you look at this passage, and Jesus rode into the city on a donkey, a, a, a young donkey. What do you call that? A colt? Colt? And is a, is a donkey something you would picture a king riding on? Number one. Uh, it isn't the first thing that comes to our minds. It wasn't a great white horse that he rode in, but a lowly donkey. He didn't ride in as a man of war, but as a prince of peace. And the donkey, it, it, it's different from a white horse or a horse because it's lower, and you're almost on ground level with a young one. So Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was a deliberate claim to be a king. A deliberate fulfilling of the picture in Zechariah 9, 9 that's quoted here. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. See, this is intentional on Jesus' part. It's planned. He was making a statement. Now, we tend to think of kings riding on a great, beautiful horse. And for many kings, that's true. However, the donkey in Jesus' day was not the lowly beast that would be, we use to represent things in this country. Uh, it was noble. And only in war did kings ride upon a horse. And when they came in peace, they came upon a donkey. Now, they rode mules sometimes in, in war back in the Old Testament period. And it was, uh, uh, so Jesus, by his action, though, at this time frame, came as a king of love and peace, and not as the conquering military hero that everybody was anticipating. I bet they were kind of confused when they saw Jesus there, although some would have recognized saying, hey, he's fulfilling Zachariah's prophecy. Uh, this is him. And, and so this, in this act of riding on a donkey's colt, Jesus underlined the kind of kingship which he was establishing and which he claimed. You see, Jesus was coming as the king of peace to save lost sinners. He was not coming to conquer and put you under uh, his thumb and to make, be oppressive. He came to set us free and to give us a peace within our hearts. The donkey was a royal animal, and the event was a coronation celebration of the king of the universe, the Jews' Messiah, and the Savior of all who will come to him in faith. So the donkey symbolized that Jesus came in peace. Now, the people in Jerusalem, what do they think about that? They immediately recognized Jesus riding on the colt as an affirmation of his sovereign kingship because they shouted in verse 38, as you see there, uh, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they were using scripture to pronounce that he is a king. So when the people saw Jesus riding on the colt, they knew that this was the fulfillment of this prophecy and that Jesus was affirming his sovereign kingship, saying, I accept this role. I am who you think I am, only I'm not quite the type that you think I am. So it's, it's one of those things. The colt should have given them a clue, but they misunderstood it. And Jesus was not making a political statement. Rather, he was making a spiritual statement. Jesus had not come to overthrow the government through military might. Instead, Jesus came in humility to be the savior of his people. A humility that's actually going to lead him to a cross, to die a very humiliating death on the behalf of his people. And he was coming to Jerusalem to die for the sins of his people. He was offering himself to be the sin bearer so that sinners might be reconciled to the Father in heaven. That leads us to the next point, and that's verses 37 through 40 in that uh, the people were praising. Now I'm going to, you got that one? The people were praising. 
And you know the story. They started shouting. They were celebrating. And I think I'll show you some pictures first. I think I got about five of them here. One, two, five. And let me, uh, so bring the lights down and, and look at these pictures. I'll show you what happens today. Now this is up on the Mount of Olives. And if you go and visit Israel, you start at a certain point at the, uh, one of the hotels up there anyhow. And as you, then you'll go down this pathway and it's called the Hosanna Trail. It's called the Pilgrim's Trail, the Praise Jesus Trail, whatever. It's a pathway that uh, would have led down to the city of Jerusalem. It's probably not the same one. Who knows what's happened there in 2,000 years. But you can see this is what it generally looks like. Now show the next slide. This is Palm Sunday. <laughs> can you imagine wandering through that? Show the next picture. That's what it's like. I was looking at this picture, and you talk about noisy. People come there, and they make a big business selling the palm fronds, and then you have people of instruments. People are shouting, singing all the way along the line. Look here. Here's a guitar there. Guitar, 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 uh, guitar, guitar. That, this guy's on a, what is that? A clarinet. This guy's got a violin. This guy's got a trumpet. Um, that, is that a trombone? And, uh, you know, it goes everywhere. Can you imagine the racket? It's going on as people are walking this Hosanna Trail. That's one of the reasons I don't do this. I, uh, they, it, although it would be kind of neat just to see what's going on on Palm Sunday, this is what it's going to be like in a couple weeks in Jerusalem. Wow. Now they show the next picture, and I think it, give, it would give the people a feel of what was going on when the thousands were proclaiming Jesus as the king. And this is the route that they take down today goes down there and it comes up on the other end and goes in where the western wall is through the dung gate into where the western wall is on the other side over here. Now in the time of Jesus, they think he went through the golden gate, which is right down here. And, uh, it, but we, uh, that, that, it, was, it wasn't there anyhow. None of those gates were there at the time of Jesus. I don't know, do I have another one? Yeah, I do. All right, this is interesting. Um, I'll talk about it later. I'm going to talk about it now. When Jesus was, was confronted by the Pharisees, and they said, you need to keep these people quiet. They were afraid that something was going to happen with Rome, and Rome would come in and call it a mild insurrection and put it down. It didn't happen, but they were afraid of that. And remember what Jesus said? He said, if these people are quiet the very stones will cry out. Meaning they're going to praise the fact that I am the Messiah, I am the one everybody's looking for. Now I was, there's a lot of stones everywhere in Israel. I always, in earlier years, I thought, well, the stones were crying, were talking about just stones laying around. But then I understand now, and after being there so many times, the Mount of Olives is a cemetery. And it always has been. At the time of Jesus, there estimated maybe 150,000 people were buried there. And it goes on the south end, and you have all these stones. Today, this is modern here. This is as you walk down the Hosanna Trail, you see this on your left. All these are stone or, or burial sites. And they, uh, they don't use flowers. See the stones on top? Stones there and stones there. They put stones instead of flowers. Pretty cheap. It works very good. But, uh, but what do you got happening here? He's saying to them that if these live people don't cry out, that these people that are wanting to be buried on the Mount of Olives because they are anticipating the Messiah to come and they're going to enter in with him through, through the gates and go into Jerusalem as a conquering king, that's what they're buried there for. They anticipate being with him. Well, uh, he says even the dead are going to cry out. That's a different take, isn't it? Even those, everybody's going to, if they don't shout out, those who are anticipating my return, they'll shout out. The stones will cry out too. Now I might be talking about the very stones themselves, but I just was looking at all these stones. That's stony. That's where the stones are. So that could be well what we're talking about. So the people were <coughs> praising. Now, let's talk about that. Luke said that as Jesus rode, Along, the people of Jerusalem spread their cloaks on the ground. And the, the other Gospels, 
tells us that the people also spread palm branches on the road. And this was the ancient manner of welcoming a king. The palm branches were important, uh, and, and it always has been in New Testament times as well. Even in Revelation 7, 9, in anticipation of a day when we'll be in heaven, it says, after these things, John said, he, he looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. So palm trees were among the earliest of the cultivated trees, and they were a symbol of victory. They were a symbol of beauty. They were a symbol of success. And they actually, at the time of Christ, was like waving the stars and stripes. They put this on coins. The uh, images of the, these trees decorated the temple. Images, the branches were used as part of the Feast of Tabernacles celebration. So the palm branches, they were making a statement when Jesus rode that donkey, and they were saying, you're our king. Victory! Victory! Now, the raising of Lazarus had caused quite, quite a stir in Jerusalem. And many who proclaimed him as the king of Israel, the Bible says, did so because of the miracle he performed in raising up Lazarus. And the Pharisees responded to this excitement by concluding that the whole world the world was gone after him. Now, the multitude started shouting then, well, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's a quotation taken right out of Psalm 118. And it obviously applies to the Messiah there as well. The first coming, the advent of the Messiah coming into the world. Hosanna originally meant save us. Save us now. Save us, O Lord. Save us now. And Perhaps the people meant, save us from our Roman oppressors. Save us from that, that, that pilot. Save us from taxation. And later the term uh, became an exclamation of praise. That's why we sing it today. We don't think about Rome when we say Hosanna today. We're not making a political statement by singing that first song and others. Hosanna, Hosanna. We're, we're saying, save us, Lord. And in our understanding, thank you for saving us, Lord. Praise be unto you. But in their time, it would have been a little bit more. And uh, it was, it was, later the term became this exclamation of praise. But the phrase, son of David, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, both clearly indicate that Jesus was being recognized as the Messiah. He's the blessed one who comes by Jehovah's authority to do his will. So here's what happened. The crowds begin to swell up. They started coming from Jerusalem as Jesus left Bethany, went up to the top, started down the hill on the other side. Things started happening. And the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice, praise, and shout, and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had been seeing. And remember, they said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And these words of praise, again, that came from Psalm 118, another messianic uh, psalm. Now, why would these people applaud him at all? Uh, the text gives us some clues. In verse 37, it says, They praised God in a loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. So these people, most of them were probably from up, up north in Galilee, where they'd seen all the miracles. They were in anticipation of Jesus doing a lot of good stuff for people to see. And miracles were what people want to see. Even, remember even Herod. He wanted to see uh, miracles by Jesus, and Jesus wouldn't accommodate him. So they had seen the crippled walk. They had witnessed the blind receiving sight. Even the dead was raised. Remember Lazarus, that same time frame. Lazarus was proof that God would raise the dead through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In a word, Jesus brought hope to the people. Now, I can imagine, say the word did get to the Romans, and they said, hey, there's a disturbance over on the Mount of Olives. Send somebody over there and check it out. So a Roman soldier gallops over there to check out the disturbance, and he's probably attended uh, wonderful processions in Rome where they do it right. I mean, if they had a parade in Rome, they did it right. The conquering general sits in a chariot of gold, 
white stallions would be pulling at the reins. And behind him are officers in polished armor, and they're carrying the colorful banners of the defeated enemies. And then at the rear comes a ragtag possession of the slaves and prisoners in chains, living proof of what happens when you get in Rome's way. So he would have known about a parade. Well, he sees this. In Jesus' parade, the adoring crowd makes up the ragtag procession. The lame, the blind, the poor, and children from Gal Galilee and Bethany, uh, let's put it this way, probably formerly lame, formerly blind, formerly uh, lost, and when the soldier looks for the object of their ad attention and adoration, he sees a man riding on a donkey, sitting on a borrowed coat as a saddle. And not, not a very impressive sight, perhaps to a Roman, but it was the best display that these people could arrive at, and it was the reception of a meek and peaceful king. He says about those stones, we know that, he says, if, if we, they keep quiet, the people keep quiet, the stones themselves are going to cry out. And the Pharisees understood quite well the significance of the event on the Mount of Olives and the people's belief in Jesus as the coming Messiah and King. And the Pharisees feared Roman retribution upon the people and the temple uh, if it came to an attempted overthrow of the government. So they were calling out Jesus and imploring his disciples to, to be quiet. Be quiet. And that's when Jesus comes out and he says, you know what? Uh, should the disciples be made to be silent? He declared that maybe even these memorial stones would cry out or maybe the stones themselves would praise God and praise the Messiah, Jesus. Let's go to the next point. And that is very simply prophecy was fulfilled. Now, if you go back to Matthew chapter 21, it's the same story. Uh, in Matthew chapter 21, verses 4 and 5, it says, this took place. It's, it's got the same story, by the way. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Well, that it says very specifically that what Jesus did was to accomplish the fulfillment of prophecy. The time had arrived for him to present himself openly to the Jewish people as their Messiah King. And he would do that in fulfillment of this Zechariah 9-9 prophecy. Now, the disciples didn't realize what was happening here in exact fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy that Jesus was actually entering Jerusalem as the rightful king of Israel. They, did, they didn't get it then. But after the Lord had gone back to heaven to be glorified at the right hand of the Father, it dawned on them that these events were all fulfillment of Scripture. You see, it goes back to number one. This was planned. It was planned by God. And it was all majestic. And we see uh, that this was prophecy fulfilled. Fifth point, it's pretty clean and clear. Jesus was filled with pain. Okay? It says that um, in 41 through 44 that, oh, let me go back to, okay. Okay, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. Now, the word for wept there is not a sniffle. That word is used over in Luke, I mean in John, where Jesus um, went to the funeral of Lazarus. And you have the shortest verse in the Bible, which is what? Jesus wept. That's the sniffle. It's a different word. This one is a wailing. He was, it was loud. You could hear him crying as he went to, uh, to, to, this, to this, in pain, what was going on here. Now, let me show you something. Um, 
first of all, yeah, let's go. I got a, how many have I got here? Four, four shots here. Again, this is Jesus. Of course, that's not Jesus, but it's a. <laughs> yeah, we actually got a photo of Jesus standing over Jerusalem here. Uh, this is to remind us of what happened. He, he got down. If you go that route today, down the hill, and there's a church on the right where it's established Dominus Flevit. I mean, the weeping of our Lord. I think that's Latin. You Latin people, which not Latin people, know how to read Latin. Is that, dom, is that what it means, Sarah? Weeping of the Lord or the Lord weeps? Or Jesus wept, yeah. And so uh, go to the next slide. And there's a certain place established for this. And this is the church of the Dominus Flevit. Um, it's shaped like a teardrop. Now up on the four corners, one, two, three, and on the other side, they're like little tear vials. At funerals, they would collect tears in little vials. And this is, for this, is, is shaped like those. Now if you go inside, show the next one, and there's a little chapel there. Beautiful chapel, acoustics great. It's hard to get in there sometimes, but if you, there's a window right up here at the altar. As you're sitting here, you look outward, and this is what you see. Show the next one. You have a direct shot with that cross. If you're sitting in the center, it'll send you right to where the temple would have stood. And it was a place where you have a view of Jerusalem and where Jesus would have entered into Jerusalem. And this was a place, eh, if Jesus is going to stand somewhere and, and stay somewhere and, and weep over Jerusalem, this is a good spot to do it. Now, this is, uh, this is what that's about. Is that the last one? Is there one more? Is that it? Okay. Then I got the next point, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now, so Jesus was filled with pain. By the way, that church is built over a 7th century church, 7th century AD, of course. And uh, it's, a, an important, it's one of my favorite places to go as you're walking down that road. Now, these verses, verses 41 to 44, are both an expression of grief and also prophecy. Jesus Christ grieves over his rejection. And he predicts the city's coming destruction because of their rejection. So he's coming as king, and he sees a city, and he stops and just cries. And he says, man, you're not going to receive me. And what was uh, true of this city will also be true of each individual who rejects Jesus Christ. Jesus cared for them, and he cares for you today. And as he drew near to Jerusalem, he wept over that city that had missed its golden opportunity to receive him. And even though they were seemingly saying, rejoicing that they were following him, we know what happened. And remember, Jesus knows all things, and it's all planned. He knows that in the end, by the end of that week, nobody's going to stand up for him. And they're going to reject him. And if the people had only received him as Messiah, it would have meant peace for them. But they did not. And they did not recognize him that he was the source of peace between men and the source of peace with God. And now he, just, he already knows it. He says it's too late. And they had already determined what they would do with the Son of God. The Pharisees and religious leaders were already planning. They had planned. To, not, to, to do away with him. They just didn't want to do away with him during Passover, but they, they speed it up. It's going to happen. And because of their rejection of him, their eyes were blinded. And Jesus gave a solemn preview of something here in this passage. He's, he sees in the future. He sees where the city of Jerusalem is being destroyed. Titus, a Roman, how that, that Roman general would surround the city, trap the inhabitants, Massacre both young and old. Level the walls and the buildings. Not one stone being left upon another. And it was all because Jerusalem did not know the time of its visitation. That happened in AD 70. And it's, he says, the, this is what's about. The Lord had visited the city with an offer of salvation. But the people did not want him. And they had no room for him in their grand scheme of things. They had their plan. Jesus had his plan. They said, we like you, Jesus. We just don't like your plan. Do it our way. And it's the same thing people are crying out today. Lord, we, we like you, Jesus. 
But uh, you are a good teacher, but this thing of you dying and us having to submit to you, repent of our sins, receiving Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we, we, eh, we're not so sure about that. Well, we know what needs to be done. We need to receive Jesus. Final point, and I'm just going to list it. It was the beginning of his passion, and you know about that. The word passion, another Latin, comes from another Latin word. I have passion them. It means suffering. And it's a week, that's why we call the week uh, after Palm Sunday up to the crucifixion and resurrection, we call it <clears throat> Passion Week. Because even though it was a victorious entry into Jerusalem, it ends in suffering. Matter of fact, if you really get to it, Jesus suffers all week. Uh, Les talked about the suffering at Gethsemane last week. And Jesus suffers all week, and it's a week of suffering. Now, it should be remembered that the so-called triumphal injury ended at the cross. Just keep that in mind. And I'm going to read to you, I have the scripture listed, in John chapter 12, verses 20 through 28. Because this is a part, I think this is a part of the entering into Jerusalem on uh, the triumphal entry. And it says some Greeks were there. And it says, it's because it's immediately following that. And they, they said, you were, there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. And these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them and said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I say to you, <clears throat> unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains al alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And he who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. See, he all, even at this point, he do. The hour has come. This triumphal entry, people are praising you and, and, and proclaiming you king. But in your, his mind, he knew the hour had come. It's done. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to be raised from the dead. And that's what's necessary for men to be saved. That was what was necessary for you to be saved. If for anybody to be saved. Jesus did the complete work of salvation. The main message that we get out of this, what are you going to do with that? Will you be like that fickle crowd? Or will you be like a true follower who awakens to the fact that Jesus is the real King of kings and Lord of lords, and he wants to be King of kings and Lord of lords in your life, allowing peace to come to your own heart. Ask him. Ask him to come in, save you, forgive you, grant you a new life. Let's go to God in prayer.